Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Audible is an amazing service which offers a huge selection to listen to, but it is also one of the best ways to make huge savings on 40k audiobooks. We're we'll continuing on this month listening to the classic heresy tale, Flight of the Eisenstein. You can join us and start listening today with a 30 day Audible trial. Get a free audiobook and full access to thousands of select originals, audiobooks, and podcasts included in the Audible Plus plan. Visit audible.com slash Lutin or text Lutin to 500-500 for those of you in the US. Full details about my new audiobook club follow at the end of this video. Each month we'll be listening to a new audiobook and at the end of that month I'll host a live stream where we will discuss the core themes and events. As always, all relevant links are listed directly below in the video notes. So once again I welcome you back into the void that is the insanity of weaponry both physical and passive of the galaxy of the 41st millennium. The reach and scale of this in the dark far future is so vast that truly the only limitation is that of human imagination and within the scope of what we consider a weapon to be this need not be something physically destructive for just as devastating are the insidious corruptions of the mind and the soul. We have learned all too well that very often the ability to turn one's will against another can lead to far more devastating consequences than a mere handheld weapon or vehicle mounted destructive force, for 40k is an arena fought on a far grander scale than individual battles, even singular worlds. It is an unending galactic conflict that is a battle of factional attrition. As we continue on, I want to note that as always, you guys continue to throw good suggestions for things to cover, and there's a whole arsenal for us to continue on with. So please, if you enjoy this series, help me by hitting that like and drop your thoughts in the comments. Every interaction helps me and the channel. If your favourite selection of insane weapons is not featured in this episode, don't worry, we will inevitably continue with future instalments, so tell me what and why below, but you'll need to join me next time to see what makes the cut. It seemed wildly overdue, and you've heard me use the word horrific within 40k context or too often, but a sensible place for us to begin today would be with the truly horrific war engines titled the Penitent Engines of the Ecclesiarchy. Most often that's referring specifically to the Adeptus Sororitas, the Sisters of Battle. The religion of the Imperium is known as the Imperial Creed. This was beginning to stir around the end of the period of heresy, and soon enough had expanded into cults dotted across the Imperium. These would soon turn into full-blown orders that would eventually collectively form into what is now the religion of the Imperium. It is the sole religion of the Imperium, and is brutally unforgiving. Planets which lean into the religious worship of the Emperor are terrifying places to occupy, as its localised rules can be extremely harsh and unforgiving. But Wherever it may be though, its single core tenet is absolutely unchangeable, that the Emperor is the all-powerful god of mankind. It seems obvious enough and easy to follow, but even the suggestion of this not being the case, or the inadvertent implication of anything else, can be a death sentence. While small differences in dogma and rites of worship would exist from one planet to another and considered reasonable interpretations as to be tolerated, but if there are any significant deviations in belief, this will eventually be considered heresy, and punishable likely by inquisition or interrogation, followed by of course death. Yet despite its overbearing presence in the Imperium, the Ministerum must constantly engage against those who could threaten its sanctity, particularly in the modern era of M41. 
uprisings of the faithless across the Imperium remain a constant scourge, and it has been many millennia since the Emperor, after all, walked among men. And with each year that passes, doubts will creep into the mind of a small percentage of a population as our traitor and Xenos incursions within hives and even upon shrine worlds. Governors and ruling noble families know that these must be promptly dealt with by local planetary defence forces, their regiments temporarily seconded to ecclesiarchy control. But where such hostilities pose a significant threat, where the extent of the corruption or the scale of the invasion is beyond the ability of local garrisons to purge, this is where the Ministorum will deploy the Adeptus Sororitas, often combined with elements of Inquisition, to eradicate the enemies of the faith. They will move and act without hesitation or mercy. The Sisters of Battle will administer the full, unbridled wrath of the Ecclesiarchy to the enemies of mankind and the Emperor. And it is by their hands which will exterminate the corrupt cabals of psychers, renegades, heretics and mutants. The Ecclesiarchy has never found itself short of methods for punishing heretical thought and action. The confessors of the Ministorum have refined a thousand forms of torture and gruesome execution. From time-honoured methods such as burning at the stake, bone-crushing repentance wheels, to slow evisceration in the dreaded rat pits. And of course we have arco-flagellation where during an agonizing process of physical modification and spiritual cleansing, the heretic's limbs will be pulled apart before being roughly refitted with cybernetic weaponry and subdermal stimulant pumps. Finally, they're fitted with a pacifier helm, which is connected to their cerebral cortex. This will saturate their mind with sacred imagery and verses from blessed texts of the Imperial Creed. The sheer volume of sensory overload will render them unable to think for themselves, and they become suggestible to specific directions, allowing their priest handlers or inquisitors to direct them. They will remain in this pacified vegetative state suppressed by their visions until battle, whereupon this overload of religious senses will be abruptly cut off, and their withdrawing crazed minds will quickly become agonised and enraged, and then are pumped full of chemicals, activating intensely painful ophthalmic goads that drive them in the direction of their enemy, as well as pain suppressors to render them immune to even life-threatening injuries. They will either survive to be put back into a passive state, or quite literally tear themselves apart by lashing against the enemy until they're nothing more than a gibbering bloody mess of writhing bone and flesh still attempting to thrash feebly at a likely already dead enemy. But why do I describe all this? We are talking about penitent engines, aren't we? So now, imagine an arco-flagellant, but turned up to eleven and you have a penitent engine. Because yes, of course, it should go without saying that for the Imperium, arco-flagellation is hardly the worst punishment. How could that be? For the heretic, to be an arco-flagellant is a mere trifle. For the true sinners against the Emperor and mankind, they are to be dragged to the darkest dungeons beneath the cathedrals of the Ecclesiarchy, where they will be tortured. Their screams will echo through the ornate arched sanctuaries. For a penitent engine is not suitable for just those who made some glib infraction of ministerial law. These are reserved for the truly abominable sinners. This means that the role of a penitent pilot is often reserved for either members of the ecclesiarchy itself, or yes, even members of the sororitas. For those who receive the sentence of a penitent engine, they will be hardwired into its gigantic mechanical framework, their cortex and mind will again be connected, sometimes as well via optical nerves, and these connectors enable the engine's torment amplifiers to be spliced with a sinner's synapses. Chemical injectors will also be implanted into their spines, similarly to arcoflagellants. From here on though, they will be enduring endless suffering, their minds will suffer a saturation like that of the Arcos, but unlike they who are stripped of all thoughts to be deluged with spiritual visions, the penitents of the engines will be absolutely saturated with senses of physical pain and spiritual guilt. It is said that it is pain itself which drives the penitent engines actuators and servos. It is a machine powered by pain and suffering. Penitent engines like the Arcos though will power toward an enemy ignoring all danger as they know that via death of their enemy and themselves only then can they earn absolution. More disturbingly though than the fairly mindless Arcos, a penitent engine upon nearing an enemy will alter their chemical synaptic inputs so that the pilot will see 
their own face upon the enemy, having spent so long racked with guilt and self-hate, they themselves with fury and bitterness for their heresy will thrash and burn through the enemy with a rage that could only be like that of white-hot metal. The arms of the engine are mounted with immense flamers to shower their foes with liquid-fueled promethium, sticking all over their enemy and burning with high intensity. Coupled with this, they're also equipped with huge circular buzzsaw blades, which can carve through even heavy armoured vehicles like tin cans. Penitent engines are rarely seen in battle unless they're accompanied also by the Sisters of Battle. And this is because the Sororitas consider it their sacred duty to bear witness to the great machines charging into the fires of combat. They believe it to be a valuable lesson for their souls to observe their fallen brothers and sisters as they atone for past sins, where every slain foe by a penitent engine's brutal juggernaut will only prove to them that this is truly a holy and righteous form of punishment. And then we also have the mortifiers. Mortifiers are a variation of penitent engine and reserved for the lowest, most hated form of sin committed, usually by the sororitas themselves, to flee from battle. A rare but exceptionally unforgivable crime in the eyes of their sisters and of course the emperor. But even more specifically, this is usually reserved for that of the repentia. Now, without going on a whole other tangent, Repentia are sisters who have already fallen from the good graces of the sisterhood and so are already attempting to prove themselves. They are bands of outcasts attempting to cleanse themselves of their sins in the fire of fury, adorned in little more than rags, carrying gigantic chainswords which they will charge across the battlefield with, only using the faith of the Emperor to protect them. The goal of all Repentia is to redeem themselves. Few achieve this goal and will usually die in battle, but for the few who have succeeded, they have often become faithful champions of the sororitas and even become revered by other sisters. For they are those who have been guided by the emperor through their darkest time of weakness and back to the path of the light. Disturbingly for this reason, some sororitas will even subject themselves to extremely harsh judgement in their actions, knowing that if they become repentia, they may seek then the guidance of the emperor themselves to prove their truest faith. So for these sisters who have already strayed off of the path of the faithful, to then also flee from battle is the most abhorrent and unforgivable sin, and their battle sisters will never allow such an individual to escape. If they are not killed outright, they may become interred as a mortifier. So simply put, a mortifier is a penitent engine turned up to 11. Mortifiers are very similar to penitent engines, but they have additional elements. Firstly, the neurological arrays will be amplified, and then metal stakes or rivets will be driven through the skeletal structure of the sister, pinning her into the mortifier framework or casket. This leaves her unable to move at all, and then a hood will be placed over her, designed to prevent any words of piety being heard by the sister. She does not deserve to even overhear them. Lastly, for any of those condemned who not only abandoned their sisters, but who actively betrayed them, perhaps even turned on them, these disgraceful individuals will also be entombed within a thick adamantine coffin. This sarcophagus is specifically designed so as to protect their tortured bodies from incoming fire and desperately swung blades. This is not unlike that of a dreadnought, except that very much unlike a dreadnought, this is not for their benefit, in fact the opposite, for this sarcophagus's purpose is in denying them the release of death. These individuals are known as anchorites, and the sisters behind these lifeless masks of penance are forced to face their torment in complete an absolute darkness and isolation. They endure years, sometimes decades, of mental and physical suffering before their final end. And mortifiers will be placed always on the front lines. They will be amplified into zealous rages of personal suffering and self-loathing. And unlike penitent engines, mortifiers will often stagger, but still charge forward, but in a strange method of motion. This is caused by the continually acute bursts of anguish and pain being fed through the sister's body, leaving the machines to look as if they're on the verge of malfunction as they jitter and stagger with speed toward an enemy, which somehow makes them all the more terrifying as they look so bizarre. 
fitted often with bolter weapons and flamethrowers, they will again shower the enemy with explosive rounds and promethium before throwing themselves into a mutilating frenzy against the enemy, a sight few would forget, as like the Arcoflagellants, the mortifiers will thrash and beat and crush and tear their enemy like crazed horrors. Except that unlike the Arcos, there is no release for the mortifiers their own aggression will not save them. For unlike penitents, mortifiers will very often survive for many more battles. And when they finally do become damaged enough to fall in battle, they will become overwhelmed with the all-consuming sense that there can be no redemption for them. And they know that only darkness and eternal suffering continues to await them. The Emperor will not redeem their soul, and this will send them into a last apocalyptic whirlwind of devastation usually bad news for any would-be enemies nearby. The penitent engines are rightfully regarded as one of the most appalling methods of punishment within the Imperium, for there is usually little chance of release, and unlike the Repentia or Arcoflagellants, death will not come soon, and they will survive to endure. Their suffering exists both as a penance and as an example to those faithful followers of the Sororitas and the Ecclesiarchy, never to stumble in your duty, nor ever doubt your faith in the Emperor. Now until now we have not featured any weapons so far by the corrupt and completely amoral beings known as the Dark Eldar. So for this episode I have chosen from then really two things in one, for it is the weapon and the plague it contains which are both terrifying, wielded commonly by the so-called Sculptors of Reality, the homunculi coven known as the Hex. The homunculi of the Hex coven consider themselves as the greatest artisans of flesh. The Materium itself is their canvas, and it is their goal and vision to produce awe-inspiring works. The Coven, since its inception, has specialised in the fabrication of curses, refined to the point where, in the eyes of primitive races, they are indistinguishable from magic. Some of the Coven's favourite curses really do border on the supernatural, unfathomable and miraculous. The Hex have slaughtered entire species simply to allow themselves the possibility of obtaining the ingredients needed to craft such technomantic maladies. And so it would be that in M36, the coven of the Hexwood Harness what will become known as the Plague of Glass. In this period, the Comrite Jalaxa would reveal some of his finest work, a series of unbelievably lifelike creations in black crystal. The material had an undoubtedly transparent quality though that some described as being glass-like. What captured the imaginations of those viewing his works were the impossibly haunting and realistic expressions of terror, agony, shock and despair. Rivals of Jalaxar would invade his laboratories that same evening, jealous and raging from his achievements, for they too sought the secrets of his mastery of this crystalline rendering, and they would destroy his labs, but therein also discover the terrible secret for Jalaxar had managed to isolate a viral helix that turned living material into crystalline glass extremely rapidly, almost instantly. This was only discovered because his rivals had unwittingly smashed this during their break-in, and now the glass plague is rapidly spreading throughout the Dark Eldar city. It vitrifies thousands before the homunculi coven of the Hex are able to bring it under control with a virus that they have determined will counter its effects, but this would not be the end of the story for the Glass Plague. The Dark Eldar quickly came to fear the Glass Plague, for it was one of the few weapons that also was able to deliver them a so-called true death, and that is one that they are unable to be repaired from, and this is something that they all fear more than anything else. They cannot be resurrected by the homunculi, and so they know what awaits them in the darkness of the void. Yet the potential of this as a weapon was not lost on the Drakari, and although greatly fearful of the Glass Plague, it is able to be weaponized into what will be known as a hex rifle. This is a long-barreled weapon firing tiny crystalline cylinders that contain a small quantity of this hex virus. It breaks on contact, and should this come into contact with the flesh of its victims, it will spread extremely rapidly, vitrifying the victim, turning them into a stationary crystalline statue. Now, albeit a useless weapon against machine kind vehicles or heavy sealed armoured units, but still a terrifying weapon against the unprotected, it can be employed as a sniper round as well for eliminating high value targets, for the contact of the glass plague means the absolute certainty of death. 
for the Covenant to the Hex, mastery and quick harnessing of the Plague of Glass released on that fateful day by the jealous invaders of the sculptor Fraud Jalaxa led to their invention of this rifle that continues to bear their name. Now, many millennia later, the Hex rifles remain the preferred weapon of many would-be Drakari assassins, their ammunition both immensely feared but also visually despairing for those who would bear witness to those they value and honour being turned before their very eyes into transparent, tortured statues, their last moments of suffering captured in transmuted crystalline perfection. Many homunculi of the Hex Coven seek to attain godhood by bleeding their darkness into the fabric of reality, for it is they who believe that it is they themselves who shall transcend the mortal plane once it stands corrupted beyond all recognition. This insatiable desire for immortal darkness is what fuels their creativity within the art of the cursed craft, for with every new horror they refine, capture or bring into existence, they draw ever closer to the point they refer to as the nadir of their experience. For the Drakari, this point stands as the polar opposite to that which we might define as the zenith of achievement. For them, it is the lowest, most depraved point that they could reach in their darkness. But for them, this is not seen as a negative, for they believe to achieve this position will enable them to step beyond that point of experience. And on the other side for them lies true immortality. Now next up, always a favourite, and it's come up before, but because it is so spectacular, it must be included. The Orc creation, known as the Shock Attack Gun. And like most Orc weapons, it does what it says on the tin. It's a big gun and it's a hell of a shock, in more ways than one. Usually when it's accidentally tearing a hole in reality and the bearer and any nearby are then dragged into the void. The Shock Attack is a truly bizarre and amazing weapon of Orc kind, both a triumph and disaster in that orc mechs kind of know what they want to make and basically succeed but probably you shouldn't stand too close to it because it functions by focusing a narrow force field through warp space itself how does it achieve this the answer is yes so the shock attack narrows this focused beam through the warp and then an entrance through this gateway will appear at the front of the weapon the exit focused toward the target in theory anything could now be fired through this space, yet it is nearly always something living. Failures of this field as the living creatures are passing through are very common, leading to their inevitably horrible deaths. But the process of travel through is mind-wrenchingly horrifying, as those being sent through are essentially being projected through warp space, unshielded, open to the horrors of the warp. No orc, even a stupid orc, would want to travel this way. However, a squig and a snotling are far more likely candidates as they hold only a very basic near animalistic level of intelligence and are unlikely to understand the consequences of this process, but they will still be driven into mindless panicked rages during the process of being propelled through even over a short space of the immaterium with no protection. Nasher squigs are basically always angry as well, so this is only then ever intensified. As the orc mech will attempt to aim the weapon, it's pretty hard to handle a gigantic gun, so the orc mech will attempt to aim this at a distance at their tiny target. This means that very often the travelling, enraged snots and squigs, who are already very unhappy about this process combined with the warp horrors, will burst out inside of enemy vehicles, or very often worse, inside of a target's armour, or even quite regularly being ported inside the living creature's own body, the snots and squigs materialising in a rabid frenzy, immediately they begin ripping, tearing through their victim from the inside out, or just generally lashing out at whatever, until they're killed or die from ripping their own limbs and bodies apart in a mindless tantrum. Not to mention the snotlings being fired through this nightmare weapon are commonly said to materialise defecating uncontrollably, whilst also ripping and biting and shredding their way through whatever they find themselves in. So it is a fun time for anybody, yes you, average Joe Guardsman, who might be unlucky enough to have a raging snotling ported inside of them. The consequences are going to be traumatising for themselves, but more than likely also for everyone around them, having to witness a snotling and bunch of teeth-filled Nasher squigs bursting out of their best mate as they're all foaming at the mouth and generally shitting everywhere simultaneously. 
Unsurprisingly, if you were inside of a vehicle, the panic would be much the same. Havoc ensues as the crew attempt to either leave the vehicle or get the horrors out. It's usually such an appallingly chaotic situation that in a comical turn, the Imperium's most powerful pieces of battle hardware can become immobilized by a mere snotling and a couple of squigs. But as noted, it is hardly a reliable piece of equipment and very regularly malfunctions. It could simply fizzle upon firing, doing nothing but enrage the orc mech who will give it a good bash in, try and get it working again. The gun might overload and literally spin out of the mech's hands, firing its targets off wherever, so that they appear back in reality, hundreds of feet in the air and splatter back into the ground to the confusion of nearby enemy. Or they may bear witness as the snotlings and squigs exit the portal funnel as if being filtered through some kind of shredder, so all that the receiving orc enemies will see is a shower of gore and viscera being poured over nearby brothers in arms. Unlikely to deal any real damage, but certainly psychologically confusing. Sometimes it's even been said that orc mechs will somehow fire themselves through the weapon in a bizarre malfunction to the amusement of nearby Gretchen. Any number of undocumented malfunctions can inevitably take place, but using a weapon that involves the warp being handled by an orc mech, you're best to just stay well, well out of the way unless you want to experience untold and unpredictable horrors. The Torsion Cannon is said to stand amongst the holiest of Mars's weapon technologies. Yet it does not have some grandiose backstory for me to tell you. It doesn't have a dramatic or sorrowful tale. It is simply another of the Adeptus Mechanicus's absolutely crazy but highly effective pieces of weaponry. As the name suggests, it is a cannon that uses gravitic torsion to quite literally distort, break and tear apart its intended target with sheer force. The effect on machines is devastating. The effect on biological or even human targets, horrific. Imagine having your bones held by invisible vice-like locks which then begin twisting in opposite directions until you break apart like a piece of dried wood, splintering and breaking in all directions. This is the effect of a torsion cannon. When energized, it sends out three synchronous gal fields that will then hold whichever sections of the target are focused in on a single point of space. Next, the sections of the cannon's barrels will turn counter to one another. The effect on the matter then grasped in the fields is that they will become mercilessly twisted, totally unable to resist the immense forces being placed on them, subjected to an impossible level of torque that few if any can withstand. The torsion cannon is not a weapon readily wielded by infantry due to this size. It's more suited for vehicles, or commonly it's used by the catafron breaches of the Mechanicus. These are heavily armoured battle servitors locked to the will of their tech priest masters. They will grind the rubble of conquered worlds beneath their tank-like treads, and the catafrons are redoubtable foes who, being servitors, are not considered especially valuable, yet also obviously the tech they're equipped with is. So being essentially remote controlled miniature tanks, they will use brute force to power their way through volley after volley of enemy firepower, their sole focus on whatever objective or destruction of enemy they're programmed with. The Catafron are often seen using heavy arc rifles or the torsion cannon to then twist and reduce their prey into mangled ruins. The Catafron are unstoppable, unrelenting, merciless, lobotomized parodies of human form. A servitor complement of even a single forge world will typically number in the tens of millions. Many were once wanted criminals, hard and intimidating persons from all aspects of imperial life. The guilty will be assessed by the Adeptus Arbites, who should they find a transgressor of suitable physical size, that individual will be sent on as a candidate to the nearest forge world, usually not without escaping an extremely severe beating on the way out. Some may be given a second chance to serve mankind as one of its most faithful servants, but others simply processed. The first stage is always for a subject to have their mind wiped clean, chemically lobotomized, so that their personality and memories are purged to provide a blank slate, or theoretically, at least. Some may speculate this were not always successful, and that some servitors remain at least partially aware of their state of being. And the less that's thought about, the better. Next, the physical body will be processed. This usually means nearly always the arms being removed so as to be replaced with weapons or tools suited to their new role. For battle servitors, the subject will then also be halved at the abdomen and permanently cybernetically grafted into a tracked motive unit. 
the brain will be hardwired with targeted computers and voice box modifications to better sing binaric praise to the machine god. As with most servitor conversions, it is a harrowing, likely for many agonizing conversion process, but then no atonement should come without sacrifice. Cataphron breaches wielding torch and cannon are rightly feared as deadly battle servitors whose bulk sits many times the size and power of those used by the rest of the Imperium. They are brutally deadly at close quarters, quite literally geared for maximum lethality. Despite all their powerful weaponry and mechanicus tech, some might argue that their most important and deadly component is the dark soul of the condemned, which can never truly be erased by any mind-wiping procedure. Is it this violent spirit that drives them forward with such reckless determination, or simply their binary programming of their tech priest masters? The Cataphron are terrifying in battle, especially to humankind, as they will breach walls and bunkers by sheer force alone, crushing into close quarters to engage their stunned and disorientated foes who, as the dust begins to clear, lay eyes on a true monstrosity. Heavily armoured, the breachers will open fire with the twisting, ripping fields of torsion cannons as their foe inevitably scatters in disarray. The breachers accelerate, crashing into their enemy, crushed beneath their heavy tracks or cutting them into pieces with piston-driven talons and arc claws. The most feared weapon, though, must surely remain as the torsion cannon, for it is simultaneously highly advanced and yet also highly barbaric, twisting flesh and metal alike into broken, twisted ruin. Within the Imperium, there are of course many figures who through the fog of war ascend to a mythological status. The fabled Legion of the Damned spring to mind, but there are many more common individuals who through some act of faith or defiance become written into human legend. Figures like Colonel Bane, Ollie P, Gaunt, Celestine, Creed, the list goes on. Few though rise to the levels of idolatry as the man, the myth, the legend, the one-man army of the Imperium. Sly Marbo. Marbo is believed to be a real but highly clouded figure within the galaxy at this point. Some may even begin to question if he is real at all or just some curious fabrication of imperial propaganda to inspire the troops. Within the world of 40k this could even be possible, although this is no more or less speculation than anything else that is known of Marbo, for his legendary battles and tales may for certain feature in some officers' reports, but far more commonly they are the passed along stories of a million guardsmen, and by the time these tales are to reach you, who knows how much has been altered, embellished or plain exaggerated. For the purposes of Imperial Honour, we must of course presume Marbo is a real figure of the Imperial Guard unless we're told otherwise. And one thing we could be fairly sure of is that Marbo was originally a fighter for the Guard upon the notorious death world of Katashan, a planet within the Imperium which is a jungle world filled with extremely hazardous flora and fauna and where the attrition rate of Imperial Guard patrols is continually disturbingly high few return from their first patrol and those who do often bear the scars for it. Some even speculate that Kadashan is a world that the Tyranid once seeded but never returned to, and the planetary life there is now extremely hostile and ferociously dangerous to humans. Yet it is a necessary world for the Imperium to occupy and so the Kadashan Guard are a permanent station upon it. The origin of the Sly title is unknown. Were this just some Kadashan tradition or given name, as with much of what is said about him, it remains speculation. Colonel Troutman, Marbo's original commanding officer, is the only figure said to know with any reasonable reliability the truth of his past. Marbo's fellow Kadashans are well aware of his deadly skills in stealth and ambush technique. Many of his allies compare Marbo in size to that of a smallish orc, his bulk said to be near inhuman, yet also able to move completely invisibly through jungle terrain defying all reasonable logic. His eyes are said to be both cold and distant, having seen far too much of the horrors in the galaxy. In between missions, Marbo paints a figure of a broken man, silent and exuding a mixture of sadness and frustrated brooding, a hulking killing machine temporarily running low on power. The Kadashan jungle fighters, as do now most Imperials, hold Sly Marbo with high regard, 
While working best alone, Marbo can help support teams of guardsmen taking on the role of an invisible sentinel, unseen but always watching their backs, exploding out of nowhere to eviscerate enemy wherever they encountered. For any guardsman, but especially the Kadashan, such a legendary guard is considered truly an honour by those he has chosen to follow. Marbo is the perhaps truest form of a one-man army. He exists only to serve as the ultimate soldier and possesses skills that surpass many of the Imperium's highly trained operatives. As a Kadashan, the jungle is his home territory and so of course excels in jungle and guerrilla warfare. Among other things, Marbo is famous for his sniper skills and is generally considered to be one of the deadliest unmodified humans in existence. It is believed that Marbo was once one of ten brothers inducted into the Kadashan 12th Regiment during fighting against the Orcs on the Forge World of Ryza, where during this conflict they were seen to be all killed. It's rumoured though that Marbo is one of these ten brothers who would then return two weeks later carrying the head of an Orc warboss, a singular bullet hole clearly visible between the eyes of the Greenskin. Some believe that it was at this engagement that Marbo's soul would harden to the emotionless killing machine he would become the sole remaining brother of ten. He gained further renown upon the Drakari incursion of Galabad. Here, a small garrison of jungle fighters were too few in number compared to the Xenos and were eventually overrun. Records detail long, dark nights of torture in which the Kadashan prisoners were dismembered whilst witches and mandrakes bathed in the blood of their victims. Colonel Troutman was said to have led the relief force that eventually found Sly Marbo standing alone and armed only with a knife covered from head to toe in alien blood, surrounded by ruined vehicles, mountains of alien bodies and once again the head of the Dark Eldar leader impaled on a spike beside him. In the modern age, Imperial Guard speak of how Marbo has fought his way from one end of the galaxy to the other while being attached to various Kadashan regiments, most notably the famed Kadashan II. Within this regiment, he works alone, hunting down and slaughtering enemy leaders, breaking the back of enemy advances and sabotaging the mightiest of war machines. On Pardus, it is said that he destroyed an entire Tau armoured convoy by booby-trapping a ravine, while on Sask's world, he captured an enemy command post single-handed, slaying the Xenos with just his bare hands and the improvised use of a ration tin. It's even said that he has been known to hunt the alien species of Tyranids specifically their infiltration lictors, for sport. Were all of this to be true and accounted for, Marbo should by all rights by now rival an Imperial War Master. He is again supposedly rumoured to have been awarded the Star of Terror multiple times for his legendary exploits. Whatever the truth is, Marbo cuts the figure of a man having seen too much hell and is surely not entirely sane at this point, which may well be worse in many ways for the enemies of mankind. Marbo is a true master of ambush and stealth. He blends into his surroundings, he covers all trace of his whereabouts so that his foes will never have any hope of preparing for when or where an attack is coming. As soon as he appears to carve through the enemy, then he will melt into the shadows, moving with precision and purpose to his next objective. His speed and focus will commonly throw the enemy into utter disarray as they frantically try to locate the killer in their midst and in some situations so confused they may not even realise he has already departed using the cover of confusion to evade an attack. Marbo's initial actions may not even be counted by an enemy until they discover how entire patrols are disappearing, supply depots destroyed and command bunkers unresponsive, later discovered of course filled with corpses. Of the few surviving enemy able to voice their experiences, many describe how to fight Marbo is like fighting a shadow, barely seen, never heard, executing out of the dark recesses and instantly vanishing. Many struggle to even accept that these are the actions of a single individual and that surely more operatives were in play and that this rumour of a single warrior are all part of the deception. Before we dive any deeper, I want to hit the tangent button and clarify that yes, as if it weren't entirely obvious, Marbo is one of those comical figures within 40k based in part on other fictional characters. Several of these exist within the verse of 40k, but the name of Sly Marbo should be wildly obvious as being an anagram of Rambo, Sly being the short version of Sylvester Stallone. Anybody who knows 40k is well aware of this. So I say it for those who are not versed in these things and may have been curious as if this were intentional. Also, something that often does get confused is people assuming that based just on this name, the figure of Marbo is meant to specifically be a 40k Rambo. 
which obviously he is, and especially when you factor in the attending Colonel Troutman, which is near enough the exact Colonel's name from the Rambo character. But Marbo is actually more of a composite character. His modern design bears very obviously a figure more similar to Schwarzenegger in the Predator Commando era, and his stance and weapon design is similar to that of Snake Plissken in Escape from New York. However, his described personal character is very much that of Rambo in First Blood. So really Marbo is the distillation of the invincible one-man army trope of 80s action movies in the context of 40k that fits him like a glove. Marbo's legendary status has reached a point where it is actively punished by officers within the Imperial Guard who feel that the wild rumours about his abilities and achievements have become a distraction, even borderline heretical. So this is outlawed generally to speak about him. Others though contend that far from having unnatural powers that point towards something undesirable and questionable, Marbo is in fact perhaps some form of a living saint. Most commonly, living saints are seen as part of the militant wing of the ecclesiarchy within the Sisters of Battle, and so most living saints of the Imperium are seen in these angelic forms. However, this need not always be the case. There are seen to be plenty of male and female living saints, many as well in Imperial Guard. And you may well remember that in the case of Colonel Bane, his final actions fighting against chaos were questionable. It seemed that Bane and his acid dogs should have perished in their final assault against chaos. Yet, by some powerful light that was said to have protected and powered them, their final fate assumed dead and destroyed by the Inquisition. But nothing is ever certain. Bane could still live. And this is very much the similar line of thinking when it comes to Marbo, having survived many encounters where he surely should have perished. Even from his very initial engagement where Sly Marbo survived against the Orc Warboss and found himself, perhaps, imbued by the light of the Emperor. Is it possible that the death of his nine brothers' sacrifice created a situation of such harrowing personal loss that it found the intention of the Emperor and that Marbo is now the vessel for this? Which is why he appears to be so unstoppable, so undeniable, so supernatural in his abilities. Who can say for sure? This is all wild speculation based on merely logical assumption than any concrete information, for we have little if any concrete information about the legendary figure of Sly Marbo. Marbo himself does not even carry an especially plentiful or extreme arsenal. His only weapons, a modified auto pistol known as the Ripper, a melter bomb for sabotage and a gigantic venomed blade from his homeworld of Katashan, said to be coated with toxin and poison so that any who receive even a flesh wound, although it seems unlikely that anyone receiving just a flesh wound from Sly Marbo will die soon after by the neurotoxins. His adapted auto pistol known as the Ripper reportedly fires armor piercing rounds but the curacy are also laced again with these venomous toxins. The idea being that if even one or several rounds enter an enemy who would in any other situation be unlikely to even notice they had been shot by such a small weapon like say an orc warboss, the toxins are not dissimilar to that of an Eversu assassin. They bring neurological death to their enemy in mere seconds. And these weapons though are not unique to Marbo. It's a favoured weapon by rogue traders and citizens living on death worlds where the native life is so extremely hostile it is a necessity and where very often carrying a weapon large enough to kill the dangers out there is extremely impractical so the more technical solution of a neurotoxin machine pistol is the default choice but these weapons may also be part of what feeds into the mythology of Marbo, given that for any observers who are not aware, he appears to be a guardsman equipped with a relatively lightweight range of weaponry. Yet for those who understand the power of a weapon in the right hands, but that also can toxify blood and neural systems in seconds, it's obvious why these are extremely dangerous when used by an expert like Sly Marbo. In many respects, Marbo exists as something like an Imperial assassin in human form, an unstoppable killing machine destroying anything in his path to complete his objective moving on forever to the next target. For the Imperial Guard though, the mythology of Sly Marbo is far more valuable than any practical achievements attributed to his name. Even a wild rumour that Marbo may be present on a battlefield can be enough to rally broken regiments and even turn the tide of battle. As some Imperial officers and commanders are reported to have said, Marbo is unconventional, borderline heretical, he is a deadly living weapon who butchers Xenos and heretic alike, yet breaks guard regulations at will, answering truly only to himself. But were it not for Marbo, entire war efforts may have been lost. 
leaving many an Imperial officer considering that as problematic a character as Marbo is, better that he is on the side of the Imperium and leave well enough alone. So now I just want to talk briefly about Audible and why it's an excellent service for you to consider getting involved in. As always, I've included some of your comments about why you guys choose to use Audible. Audible is consistently the best value when it comes to audiobooks, and that's more important for people these days than ever. Also, with that in mind, Audible recently released their new plan, Audible Plus, and this is all about giving members a chance to listen to and explore different formats, discover new favourites, classics, or things you've maybe never even considered before. Within Audible, as you can see, you can easily narrow what's available within the Plus category or search within specific themes and genres. The other option is Audible Premium, and that actually remains the standard price as per before, and within that you get one credit per month for an audiobook of your choice, and if that's a 40k audiobook, you're looking at often 10 hours or more of content, but then you also get access to the whole Audible Plus range and all the other benefits that come with Audible. We are of course continuing on this month with the Audiobook Club, and the title selected is the classic Horus Heresy Tale Flight of the Eisenstein. I've always said that you can listen to the Heresy audiobooks in any order. If you want to listen to them obviously in chronological order, that works too. But I think there's no issue with listening to this one. If you haven't heard the others, I think so long as you have a grounding in 40k, it will make sense. And it is an amazing story, but one that I've not listened to for some time, so I'm looking forward greatly to going through it once again. Now, if you're not a member with Audible already, this is a great opportunity to trial it and use the free audiobook offer. Remembering, you need to choose the Premium Plus option for the free audiobook offer. Eisenstein is a longer audiobook than our last at around 11 hours, and I announced this a little while ago on my community tab, but if you missed that, you still have about 10 days to cram it in. Two good hobby sessions will get it covered. Then on the last day of this month, which is the 28th, I'll arrange a live stream. Details again will follow on my community tab and social media. You can then join me where we will discuss this audiobook live. Last time this was greatly successful, and yes, I will aim to try and bring you guys a version of it to YouTube soon for any who missed out. You can get involved today by starting your 30 day Audible trial with Premium Plus and this gets you the free audiobook as well as full access to thousands of originals, audiobooks and podcasts. Visit audible.com slash Lutin or for those in the US text Lutin to 500 500. As always a huge thanks to all of you for supporting me here on the channel and as always I'll see you in the next one.